Welcome to tonight's webinar on the virtual elimination of HIV. My name's Naomi. I am the uh, lead for the VITAL program. VITAL is the Victorian HIV and Hepatitis Integrated Training and Learning Program. Um, I'd like to take a minute before we begin just to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which our works takes place. Uh, for those of us in the northwest Melbourne, that's the Wurundjeri people, the Boonarong people and the Wathaurong people, and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging, and I extend my respects to the unceded lands from which our presenters and audience are joining from, and pay my respects to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people joining us tonight. Um, so VITAL delivers BBV and SCI education statewide for primary health care providers, including the S100 prescriber accreditation and training for HIV and Hepatitis B. You can find out more um, on our training on our website, which you can access via the QR code or the UR listed on our next slide. Uh, but first, I'd like to thank the Department of Health as our funding partner, as well as the VITAL consortium members who come together to deliver the program. So that is our uh, website there um, and the URL as well. Um, so feel free to jump on there and um, check out our website. Um, so tonight's session will run for about two hours and it is being recorded. All, registrant, all registrants will receive a link to the recording after the session and you'll be able to view um, this in the future. If you have any tech issues with your sound or mic, please feel free to leave the room and restart and we can admit you back in. Otherwise, you may be able to, able to dial in. Just let me know if you need those numbers. Um, so we would love everyone to have their videos on tonight. We have a really great program ahead with some incredible presenters for you and we're really encouraging discussions. So being able to see our audience really helps to facilitate that. Please also ensure your name appears on your Zoom, the same as um, how you registered, so that we can get your CPD certificates to you. We'll be popping up some polls throughout the session as well, and we really encourage you to ask questions as we go. So you can either raise your hand or pop your questions in the chat, and we'll be monitoring this as we go. Um, so as I said, we have some fantastic panellists um, for you tonight. Facilitating is the Associate Professor Edwina Wright from the Department of Infectious Disease at the Alfred Hospital, Dr Lisa Doyle, a GP at the Paran Market market clinic chris williams co-founder of prepped for change um, we've also got felicity sakari acting manager of sexual health and viral hepatitis uh, public health division of the department of health who'll be providing her insights into key aspects of the strategy and how it was developed professor mark stuvay head of public health co-head of HIV elimination and head of justice health at the Burnett Institute, who's going to help us understand the challenges of increasing the number of people living with HIV who are diagnosed, including his thoughts on some of the idea ideal testing options for this population. We've also got Associate Professor Graham Brown, who's the Acting Director of the Centre for Social Impact at the University of New South Wales, who's going to talk to us about how we can measure changes in quality of life in HIV populations and the challenges of greatly reducing stigma and racism by 2030. We also had a lived experience speaker that was going to join us uh, tonight. Unfortunately, they were unavailable to attend at short notice. So um, our sincere apologies that we do not have that uh, perspective for you tonight. Uh, but thank you so much again for joining. Um, and I will hand you over to Edwina. as we go and I, I'm trying to come from the big picture zoom out zoom zoom coming from out and then go in uh, coming into more detail right down into Victoria so everyone knows we have about 26 nearly 27 million people here of whom three percent in this country are indigenous our updated most recent HIV zero prevalence is 0.14 percent um, we have in the last um, diagnoses in Australia through the Kirby, uh, it was 67% of new diagnoses occurred in men who have sex with men. And between 2011 and 2020, there was a 
5% decline in HIV notifications. Fortunately, we're a democracy. We have Medicare, pharmaceutical benefits scheme. We're on our eighth and the national HIV strategy and the ninth one is being put together. And we're well known around the world at the moment for having had um, over 50,000 people um, having been prescribed PrEP on the PBS in, in, in this country. So we're narrowing down a little bit. We're down to Victoria, down near the Antipodes, where we have about 10,000 people living with HIV. We were the first city state, um, or let's say the first city to uh, in Australia to join fast track cities back six coming on seven years ago. We were also the first Australian jurisdiction to endorse U equals U in 2017. Since PrEP came on PBS in 2018, we have had about 14,000 people dispense PrEP. And it's always worth mentioning the fantastic partnership that we have with community activists, um, clinicians, uh, researchers, peak orgs and government. Almost everyone, every one of those groups is here, is here on this um, panel tonight and people in the audience, of course, as well. So if I now may just come to some more finer detail about Victoria in uh, just to uh, concentrate on this box is probably easiest just to say to you that in 2021, a tough year with COVID, uh, we had 140 new, um, new, uh, new diagnoses, not newly acquired, but just new diagnoses, 63% of which occurred in men who have sex with men, 23% within heterosexuals, and coming up to nearly a half born overseas. And I think these are, these are very important numbers to keep in, in, in front of mind. That percentage of diagnoses in men who have sex with men is definitely, definitely declining over time from sort of more like 80%, 75%, now 63% diagnoses in MSM. It's definitely fallen. I now want to imagine, get you to imagine that you've just um, gone into Google and looked up the Fast Track Cities website and gone to the city of Melbourne and the state of Victoria and looked at our care cascade. One of the panelists joining us tonight, Professor Mark Stuve and his colleague um, Richard Gray at the Kirby do a lot of work together to update the, ca um, the care cascades for the different states. And in this, in this state, in this case, it's the state of Victoria. So it You'll see, I've um, told you there's 10,000 people living with HIV, but around this time, the, the rough figures were around eight and it was at 2020. So these figures are relevant for 2020 and I imagine they'll be updated next year. But at that time, to, I think towards the end of 2020, 90% of Victorians living with HIV were diagnosed. So 10% were not. Of those diagnosed, 92% were on treatment, meaning 8% were not, and we'll address that tonight. And of those on treatment, 96% were virally suppressed. And that probably doesn't surprise people. In fact, it's quite likely that it could even be a bit higher in, in some settings in Victoria clinics, perhaps some um, tertiary referral hospitals. So it was 90, 92, and 96, if you can hold on to those figures. So now coming to finally to discuss this uh, victorious um, sexual and reproductive health and viral hepatitis strategy, that is the parent document within which the HIV plan sits. And we're very fortunate to have Felicity Sakari tonight from the department uh, talk in more detail than I'm able to, and certainly wouldn't have time to, but this is what the actual um, sort of look is that we have a, a strategy and a number of plans within that strategy and I'll just show you I'll show the depiction of those visually <clears throat> I'm very so here we have the strategy I'm sorry the the um the figures are so small but you can see there's six strategies there Victorian and Aboriginal um sexual and reproductive health plan the Victorian hepatitis B plan there Victorian hepatitis C plan Victorian HIV plan which we'll be discussing the Victorian Sexually Transmiss Transmissible Infection Plan, and the Victorian Women's Sexual and Reproductive Health Plan. So we, they have all been combined as plans within one overarching strategy. And we'll, we'll ask Felicity to reflect on that in a moment. So we're only focusing in this session tonight on the Victorian HIV Plan. It re, it, it's there for um, eight years, 2022 to 2030. But those of us who uh, were fortunate enough to be 
invited to contribute ideas to the plan and, and there was very wide consultation. Um, we um, thought that it would be a good idea to have us almost a halfway mark at 2025 and punt to reach some targets by 2025. You can, uh, you can debate the merits of doing that. Um, that. Is it too much pressure? Is it unrealistic? But at the end of the day, we felt that giving the energy and the momentum with a more proximal target is probably the wiser thing to do. So by 2025, the Victorian HIV plan, as it sits in the overarching strategy, we thought that 95% um, of people living with HIV would know their status. Remember, I said only 90% did in 2020. We thought that 98% of people on um, would um, be on treatment. Those who are diagnosed would be on treatment compared to 92% in 2020. And that 98% of those on treatment would have an undetectable viral load. And it was more like 96% in 2020. So they are 2025 targets, but wait, there's more. Um, and also, and of course, this is the big vision, is that we will try to reach a state where one could say we have virtually eliminated new HIV transmissions by 2025. And of course, what that means is really, really important. And, and, and it's a technical definition. Um, in populations like gained bisexual men in this country who are very well studied and we have fantastic surveillance, epidemiological surveillance mechanisms, including the access network, which Mark Stuve works with, we have been able to track testing and diagnosis of gay and bisexual men in jurisdictions throughout Australia very well. So because of that, we can be more precise. In fact, talk about infections per year for this definition. So with gay and bisexual men, a, a definition of virtual elimination would be that we would see a reduction in new infections in gay and bisexual men to less than one person per, less than one, per thousand gay and bisexual men per year. So that's that's what can be used with gay and bisexual men because we've got a way of measuring that. We're confident we could measure that with, with some precision. But for other populations who are perhaps not so well uh, able to be so well characterized, there is a UNAIDS definition which um, says we um, virtual elimination of new HIV would be a 90% reduction in new infections relative to a 2010 baseline. So um, what I've done here is I don't have for Victoria, I wasn't able to find, in fact, the Kirby will talk about uh, HIV infections, but it's per 100,000 and it's sort of general population as opposed to just gay and bisexual men. So one thing I've tried to do here is look today actually at, at um, the, the health department website to look at newly acquired infections. Um, I've focused on that. And here on the x-axis, it runs from 1983 to 2002. And the, um, it's in, goes up to 150 there on the y-axis. So if you look at 2010, which is the column here, there were 105 newly acquired cases. Uh, in, to, in, in 2010. And then if you come up to 2021 um, and look at the newly acquired infections uh, in 2021, it was 37 cases. So we actually saw a 65% reduction between those 12 years um, in newly acquired infections. And the red here in these boxes denotes males. So most of the most of the figures of the 105 cases and 37 cases are men. So that is a kind of a clunky way of trying to get a picture on how close are we by 20, how close are we um, to even, maybe the dogs, um, how close are we to um, perhaps reaching that? And this is not proper, like a, this is just me doing a back of the envelope um, calculation. But COVID had a lot to do with that. You can see this is the 20, 2014, we were declining 2015, 2016, PrEP became available, big studies then 2018, but we were bouncing back up in 2019, then COVID came. 
So that's just to try and give you some kind of indication of perhaps there's a chance we will get there ultimately to virtual elimination. Finally, additional 2025 targets, and we'll address these tonight, is 75% of people with HIV report good quality of life by 2025. And importantly, 95% of people at risk of HIV infection use one or more forms of effective HIV prevention. And that's very ambitious. We also have a 2030 target pushing it back out, but less than 10% of people would report experiences of stigma, racism, and discrimination uh, in the health and social support settings. So that target is staring us in the face, healthcare providers. That's actually about us. That's not about the community. That's about what we're doing. So um, what I'll do here um, now is to, is to uh, in, invite um, Felicity Sakari to um, join us on the panel. Um, I might have to stop sharing the screen, I think, um, and uh, invite Felicity to um, have a chat with us to um, about the strategy. Felicity, hi. Hi, Duena. Hey there. Um, thank you very much for joining us um, this evening. And I gave a pretty precise overview of the strategy and the plans. Would you be able to give us an idea of what, what's different about this strategy and what's new? We're going to ask the audience a question soon. We're going to have a poll about what they think about the strategy and what's achievable, just, just to get a sense of where people, how confident people are feeling. But would you be good enough to talk to us about what's different about this strategy and, and, and why did we want to make it different? Okay, well, first of all, thank you very much for having me this evening. It's lovely to be here to talk about the strategy and the plan because it was launched just at the start of Caretaker, so we didn't have a big launch event. So this is an opportunity to talk about it. I will just note, I'm waiting for an antihistamine to kick in, so I'll try not to cough too much. But it's very windy out there. All right, yeah, of course. Yeah. So um, just with the strategy, we had a starting point with our previous plans, HIV the two HEPs the Women's key, key Priorities and the STI Action Plan. So that was our st starting point. So we, we knew we were going to build on that. We also had um, the Victorian Sexual Health and Service Needs Review in 2019, which called for a stronger statewide sexual health system to meet population need. And the third part of building our strategy was a course for consultations. And thank you for acknowledging the extensive com consultations. We did sort of have two and a half years worth of sort of we went back and forth with it. But a major consultation was in 2020 in the pandemic in the middle of the lockdown with a series of online consultations based around HIV, two Aboriginal Victorian workshops, two HEP workshops and the STI Action Plan. And I think what we heard across all those different workshops was very consistent. We were hearing the same messages come up from all the different workshops, you know, the importance of peer-led workforce models, um, stigma and discrimination as a key issue, the need for data to measure, the impact of stigma and discrimination, better engagement with communities, um, innovations in testing, improving partnership with primary care. But more than anything, what we heard is about the opportunities for integration of BBB, STI and reproductive health across the system because they're all operating, the responses all operate in the same or overlapping systems. So we took those three components and came up with the strategy, recognising that there are the four system enablers that are, that are um, consistent across the, each of the disease responses or the um, cohort responses in reproductive health, but also recognising we need individual plans because there are still individual responses to each of the plans. And even though there's overlapping priority populations, still within each of the plans, that it's important that we target the right priority populations. So we've got our system enablers, reducing stigma and racism, partnerships and collaboration, strengthening workforce and supporting data and um, su surveillance and research. So this is the first time all those have been bundled together on the, under the one umbrella strategy. First time in Victoria, um, first time in Australia, and I'm gonna call it as first time in the world, even though I don't actually know that for sure, but I'm calling it. <laughs> and even though it was a very extended um, development process, partly um, COVID had a lot to do with that, in some ways, developing it was the easy part, and now we've got the difficult part of trying to implement it. 
is this is a change for all of us how we operate and to work close closer together across the different systems. So rather than going out and doing just specific, say, HIV training for health professionals, we're incorporating STI where, where relevant. We want testing at the same time. So it's a big shift in how we work. And that's why we needed the strategy sitting on top to give that direction of how we work going forward. That's my thank little... You. No, thank you. That, that's really <coughs> marvellous. Um, the, the, uh, would you perhaps be good enough to talk or talk with us a bit about the system enablers? Because not everyone, not all of us, and I still wrap my, have to wrap my head around that. It's a concept that I think is... Um, it's a very kind of important concept that we experience and intuitively we know it. But when we start trying to think about that layered horizontally across those plans, would, would, or, or, yeah, would you be good enough to talk to us a little bit about that? So the four, four enablers um, that were chosen are sort of the main ones that we need to address to not just achieve our elimination targets, but also support the priority populations in accessing the services as well. So stigma, reducing racism, stigma, discrimination, and the racism um, we include, included um, as part of having the Aboriginal um, Sexual and Reproductive Health Plan. We know that people face stigma and um, discrimination, and we know that stops people from accessing services. So we do have an aim to reduce that. And because it is the government, at the end of the day, it is the government strategy and the government plan. We're focusing on those um, settings that we can influence that, and that's those health and community um, settings. So there will be a range of, there are a range of activities targeted towards that. That's um, the services maybe having reconciliation action plans or doing the work, but also um, the workforce training as well. With um, strengthening workforce capacity, it's again very similar. The workforce is, um, across the system, people are not, not always just dealing with one HIV or STIs or HEP, but they're in a service that may be addressing all of those. So we want to make sure they're getting training across all, all the, the system as well. And also it's about um, making effective use of health professionals. They, don't, they have very limited time for training. So we don't want them going for three different, almost identical sets of trainings for different diseases, but do bundle it up and do it all together. But also so they can provide the appropriate um, treatment and care to, to people as well. And they know where to, more importantly, where to refer people to if needed. So we have those referral pathways in place. We'll support them with that. Partnerships and collaboration is so important. We can't work in silos anymore. We have to partner up and about tap into organisations who are maybe doing things working in a space we want to get to or what, what efficiencies can we um, find by par partnering up with other organisations. Because the reality is there's not more funding for this strategy, not from lack of asking, but there's not more funding for implementation. So we need to find efficiencies, better ways to work together to, um, to, achieve, to achieve our goals and our targets and implement some of the activities. And then the data surveillance and research. Again, it's a very um, disconnected surveillance system at the moment, and we want to make sure that's better connected. One, so we can see what's happening out in the system, so also people are su supported. They're not having to um, repeat information every time they go to a different service as well. It'd be good if they, they've got more of that continuity care. They can walk in anywhere and know they're going to be looked after properly. And we have a range of... Um, priority actions and activities in the, the plan. And the thing is, some of those will sit with government, some of them will sit with funded agencies, some we don't know who they sit with yet. So once we get sort of really kickstart with our implementation, we'll be sort of working some of that out, where, where the responsibility sits, and if we need to sort of, who do we need to part, partner with to move some of those activities forward? There's a lot of activities across, there's seven documents, there's a lot of activities there. There are a lot of activities there, but thank you very much for um, walking us through those four chief enablers that, in, as I said, I think intuitively we get it, but when they're elucidated and brought out for discussion in, in that sort of discreet way to discuss each one discreetly, and efficiency seems to be um, sort of the, at the heart of a lot of that. It, we can be cynical though about efficiencies and, it means, you know, like we're uh, uh, not, and I'm not suggesting you're saying this, but people are, I think, get tired of thinking being asked to do 
more with less. And so it sounds like the next steps that you alluded to about working out are things like data surveillance. And you also mentioned people could walk into a place and data would be available to them, even if they hadn't been to that clinic before. Are you in a position to talk about that a little further? No. That's the okay. aim. That's a very long-term aim. And okay. I think realistically, we've got hun hundreds of activities sitting in the strategy and across the plans. It's going to be a phased approach. We're not going to meet all of them by the midpoint review or maybe even by, by the eight-year point. But we, we need to know this is what we're working towards. This is our vision. If we want to achieve the targets and goals, these are all the things that we need to do to get there because it's not going to be one thing or even 10 things it needs to be a whole raft of things to make that change and I, I agree efficiency some people sort of I think think that's a criticism but it's but it's not we're all working in the same system so how can we do that a little bit better and not repeat conversations or activities but sort of build them up and do them together mm -hmm. The um, strategy reflects, um, to some extent, care. And that's um, the fact that we can uh, talk about wanting and needing to look after 10,000 Victorians living with HIV, in a way, is testament to the great success we have as a state um, that has been able to deliver treatment to so many people and, and help them stay on treatment in, in, and, and enjoy long lives. And so we are blessed with the opportunity, if you like, it's been, it's a, it's a success. This is all about success. Success uh -huh. isn't just in ending transmissions by any means, any means. Um, do you have a sense of um, how in looking ahead in the strategy, how, how, what proportion of people might be able to be looked after in the primary care setting versus tertiary referral hospitals? Could you speak to that for us? Um, I, th I think if you sort of, with the Special Health Service Needs Review, I think if you look to that and if you talk to our strategy, we very much talk about people getting the care they need when they need it, but also more locally as well. So I think longer term, that is the plan to get people, if they can be looked after locally or where it's convenient for them, that's what we'd be looking towards. And definitely, definitely that's about strengthening the primary care system more sexual health clinics um, attached to that but also upskilling sort of training for the staff to be able to the health professionals whether it's nurse-led or um, increasing peer-led getting the support out in the primary care network and that's again that's a very long-term goal that's going to take a long time to build up because we are very much shifting from a centralized model to more decentralized acro across the state. And of course, that will depend on workforce capacity as well, because that's, that's the other key ingredient. Um, we um, have a, the invitation for from our current premier or in, uh, in currently got, uh, they're um, in caretaker mode at the moment, of course. But the idea of bringing in nurses um, to you know and free to to provide free healthcare, free training for nurses. Yeah. Um, I wonder where the responsibility might lie to incentivize um, clinicians and, and nurses to become, to, to in, adopt a career into what is now an area which this strategy is trying to bring together a convergence of sexual health, um, reproductive health, um, and sort of an Indigenous health is actually could be pitched as a, a very rewarding um, future career paradigm do you have any thoughts on 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 that and is there a way we could influence the that sort of nursing huge pool of nurses and perhaps younger doctors towards this this um uh, this area um i would say always feel free to write to the minister definitely <laughs> <laughs> even though we'll get the letters i think that about i think it is a huge opportunity and i think part of that is um Maybe VNSCI and sexual and reproductive health may be having a bit more vis visibility, whereas at the moment it doesn't. And I don't think people know, actually know or can identify that as a career path. So I think it's setting up some career pathways. But there was an announcement um, last week. There's also going to be, depending on who gets in, potentially scholarships for, um, I think it was 100 
100 health professionals in the women's health space. So I think it's definitely um, something that's an opportunity that we can tap into, depending which government gets in, but making it a um, sustainable, attractive career path is some of that as well. I think perhaps one thing we may have not, not put in the strategy but at this in, the, in its current iteration, but we do go back to in 2025, I think is a chance for us to go back, is think about um, uh, not retirement plans, but sort of passing on the baton of, because we actually run, Australia does, but I think Victoria, I don't think I'm speaking out of turn to say we run a very you know, we want run a mon wonderful model of partnerships between high case OGPs and hospitals, nurses, and um, being able to pass that on and having a formal, almost formalizing the way to hand the baton on as those of us sort of step out, you know, of the workforce in the next however many years might be a great way forward also for the for the people, people who are living with HIV. Mm. Let me write that down. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that's true. And I think at the moment, a lot of it relies very much on passion, people with passion finding yes. this as a career, as a career or a niche. But I, I think as our sexual health and reproductive health system that expands, more people will see it as a career opportunity and, and see how broad and interesting it can be as well. Yeah. yeah. No. Well, I think many people on the call will be pleased to um to know that just sorry I should back up and say everything you've spoken to us about just now speaks to the need for time and and we do need time and hence having an eight-year strategy feels like thank goodness we have got time to 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 move this forward you know notwithstanding any other things that might come upon us in terms of pandemics and and climate emergencies like literally will take up a lot of energy and time in healthcare in healthcare settings we do have eight years to get a lot of this done and hopefully quite a lot of successes in the short term. Um, thank you very much, Felicity. If you can stay on, we'd be so delighted, but we understand you may not be able to. Um, and uh, we'll, I'll try and invite people back in um, to, to talk um, as we go. But I'm going to now hand over to um, both my colleagues, Naomi and Chris Williams, who have put together um, Chris has put together some questions that we're going to use throughout the um, the this this two-hour session. And Chris, could I, Naomi, could I ask you to throw up the first uh, poll actually for the audience, and and we should all vote when it comes up. Thank you. Can I vote or should I abstain because it's... you know? Well, it's up to you. We won't know. No one will know. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much, Edwina. And, and yes, I think exactly what Edwina said. We really wanted to make the session a bit more interactive, so you have the opportunity to uh, to interact with the session rather than just sit there, sit there and, and, and play along at home. Um, but with these polls, there are multiple choice polls. Um, this one, there's no right or wrong answers. We're just interested to find out um, how confident are you that all the goals in the new plan are achievable by 2030? Uh, we've got four different multiple choice is there, whether you're confident in, in that all goals can be achieved, most of the goals, few of the goals, or not confident about achieving any of the goals. So just a temperature check on that one. If you're able to submit your vote, um, hopefully through the magic of Zoom technology, once that is submitted, Nomi might be able to tell us what the result is. Sure can. Um, so I will just end the poll now. So you should all be able to see the results. Um, now so 65 percent are pretty confident that we're achieving most goals there oh that's excellent that's, that's very encouraging to see that there is certainly a huge amount of enthusiasm and hopefully excitement about, about this plan and that hopefully it does appear appear to be realistic for people that that's very encouraging to see um i think we have a second question lined up as well um and that is if Naomi, you're able to get that one onto the screen this is a bit more of a technical question, just to kind of test whether you're familiar with these concepts or not. Um, it is a question around dried blood spot testing and to work out whether you are aware of dried, dried blood spot testing for HIV. A multiple choice, just yes or no answers. Um. Hopefully we can give it one a minute and um, once you've seen those answers come in, hopefully we'll have a response. Uh, 
Yep, all good. So actually pretty pretty close with that one, nearly 50-50. Interesting. 45% said yes and 55% said no, they have not or they're not aware of dry blood spot testing for HIV. Um, Edwina, I'm sure that you'll be able to give me more of the, the or give the audience more of the, the technical definitions and then how dry blood, blood spot testing works. But from my community perspective, I certainly know that dried blood spot testing or DBS testing for short is, is quite popular in, in New South Wales. However, it's not something that we leverage really here in, in Victoria. Uh, I'm not sure what's the systemic reasons as to why, why that is, why we don't use that, but it is something that's very, very convenient, suitable and quite popular for New South Wales. Uh, my understanding from a process perspective is, is that somebody can request a DBS testing kit in the post. Uh, they do a very simple finger prick and drop a little blood spot onto a piece of card. That blood spot dries and they can post that card back to a centralized lab for testing and a result is available to them by SMS or email confidentially a week later to give them either a reactive or a non-reactive result. So that's quite an easy, convenient finger prick testing method that we have available. Um, Edwina, I don't know if there's anything you wanted to add to that kind of more on the, on the uh, clinical perspective. No, but uh, if um, if we're ready or when we're ready, it's really a great way to introduce our next um, guest speaker and panelist, um, Professor Mark Stuve. Um, perhaps we could hand over um, and in invite Mark to join. And uh, if you're finished with that poll, Naomi and Chris, thank you, Mark. Hello, I've seen you join. Um, Hi, Edwina. Hi, everyone. Hey, how are you? Thanks for joining us tonight. Really appreciate your time. So yeah, we thought um, with a kind of a, a, a wistful look at looking up north in New South Wales that does have dried spot, dried blood spot testing. It was a great way to bring you in as a as an expert in many areas of HIV, including HIV prevention. And um, you may have missed um, the, the sort of prelim talk I gave, which was essentially the work you and um, Richard Gray did to provide the fast track cities with a cascade of care for 2020, which was 90% of people in Victoria, only 90% of people in Victoria living with HIV know their diagnosis. And it's really hoping, hoping to talk with you this evening for the next 15 or so minutes. And we'll take um, questions from the chat if they come up. I, what is that about? Where, who are these 10% of people? And then I might just talk a little further you, to you about what's what we have that's available for testing what you think we should be doing so mike what do we know about 10 percent of people perhaps who don't know they're living with hiv um they are a very difficult um population to research um the burnett institute led the country's first um by behavior um uh, bioprevalence study, the suck and see study in the late 2000s, and we actually found an extraordinarily high level, surprisingly high level of undiagnosed HIV amongst uh, gay men at, at gay venues in Melbourne. 35% of people who tested positive did not uh, self-reported that they did were not uh, living with HIV, uh, which is quite remarkable. Um, that went on to inform the COUNT study, which was a national study led by um, Martin Holt. Um, it's a notoriously difficult thing to measure. And the cascade uh, that Richard Gray prepares, the national cascade, and he supported the Burnett in providing the Victorian cascade, that's a modelled estimate, uh, largely based on CD4 count at diagnosis and then back projecting how long people are likely to have been living with HIV um, prior to their diagnosis. Um, who they are... Um, I think my guess is it's a combination of people at relatively high risk who are not testing frequently enough um, and those who are not accessing, accessing testing rarely and who maybe perceive their risk to be low um, and are maybe rarely accessing testing or have never been tested before. Um, we see a lot of um, migrants, migrant students in particular prior to um, COVID landing. Um, being diagnosed with HIV at their first test in Australia, particularly at Melbourne Sexual Health Centre. Um, so I, I think it's a combination of the rarely tested um, and the um, people at high risk who are just not testing enough. And the challenges there are really, I think, I think there's two words, you know, and, and that's convenience and equity um, are the two things that are sort of holding us back in terms of driving, uh, you know, getting that undiagnosed prevalence down. With convenience, um, 
the overwhelming majority of HIV testing and diagnoses continue to occur in general practice. And we know there's a lot of pressures in, in terms of accessing general practice, in terms of finding appointments, operating during business hours, and I think also perceived stigma um, from people attending general practice in terms of disclosing their risk behaviours and therefore a clinician you know, recommending a HIV test. Um, we've got a walk-in service at Melbourne Sexual Health Centre. Um, and I know, you know, Felicity, that we're decentralising the sexual health network, but for a long time to have had one sexual health centre um, servicing, you know, what we have now approximately 6 million people um, is, yeah, well under, under the odds. Um, you know, there's point of care testing, but those tests have never really been suitable for general practice because of the incubation period and, you know, quick consults and billing and those sorts of things. Um, so they're, they're some of the convenience things. In terms of equity, um, Medicare and eligibles um, and students who may have to pay out of pocket um, or the uh, students on, on student visas who pay out of pocket, who get um, potentially reimbursed through their private health insurance, but they have to initially pay out of pocket. Um, and I also think there's geographic coverage around equity, you know, suburban, outer metropolitan, rural, um, you know, all of our high caseload general practice clinics are, are located close to Melbourne, um, confined to the inner city, um, and those residing elsewhere are reliant on those low caseload general practice, general practices, um, where again, convenience is an issue and, and stigma is also an issue in those locations. Thank you, Mark. I might just quickly um, bring in um, to discuss the, um, well, actually, if I could preface it by saying, like, points of entry into the HIV testing system, PrEP, PrEP has helped that a bit. Mark, could you yep. reflect a little bit on that? Is it is it only really gone up in people who use PrEP and not everyone <laughs> else? Is that the bad news and the good news all in one? Yeah, look, you know, driving uh, undiagnosed infection down is all about testing frequency but you need to ramp up testing frequency amongst those at risk. Um, and we know that people who are on PrEP and adherent to PrEP are at zero risk of acquiring HIV. So some of the testing frequency data that is reported nationally is distorted by high frequency testing amongst PrEP attendees. So at their three monthly PrEP visits, they get a HIV test. So that's really ramped up the um, HIV testing frequency data. When we've looked at the access uh, surveillance network and we remove people uh, who are accessing PrEP, um, we've seen that the testing um, frequency is barely budged. Mm -hmm. um, so amongst people who continue to be at risk, um, we haven't uh, been successful in increasing HIV testing frequency in Victoria uh, or nationally. So this, that is really like, that, that that's so in it's sort of in almost intransigent that it's not intransigent it could be changed but do you have thoughts on that I mean we, I was I should mm. just finish what I was uh, the, the line is like pep we pep is a testing portal uh, as you said seeing your seeing your own doctor um self-testing um you met the Atomo test. Could you tell us about that? The only test that's licensed on, on, on the therapeutic uh, registry. Could you tell yeah. us TGA registry? Sure. Um, so the Atomo test was registered uh, a few years back um, as the only self-test that's licensed in Australia. It's a finger prick uh, test. So similar specimen to uh, what Chris was talking about before in, in relation to the dry blood spot. Um, it's a it's a very neatly designed test. It, it's um, it, it a really nice, uh, convenient test to use. It's highly accurate um, because it is um, blood spot. It, it's a capillary finger prick based specimen. So the oral fluid tests that are available in other countries, while they're more um, potentially more palatable because the specimen collection uh, is, is easier to do and, and less invasive. They are um, not as accurate as, as these tests. Um, the TGA did put some interesting caveats around when they initially uh, licensed this test. Um, so it could, it initially it was only available through the manufacturer's website. Um, people had to sit down and watch a two minute instructional video in order to order it online. And it was available through also um, uh, peak community organisations and some sexual health um, sort of centres as well. So 
um, access was sort of left to the, um, the manufacturer um, and promotion was left uh, to the manufacturer. Um, I actually think there's a role for government and, and even potentially, um, you know, the collaborative networks you speak about, Edwina, the high caseload clinics, um, you know, our, our strong uh, network of um, support services through Alfred Health and, and government to get involved in, in presenting self-testing options to the community or almost as a, as a virtual high caseload clinic network type thing. You know, can we actually make... Uh, self-testing available to the community with a similar sort of um, strong model of care that we get, you know, at those services. And, and that would involve, you know, supporting people um, during the testing process and also ensuring that they're aware of what they should do if they screen positive at home using, using a self-test. Yes, thanks. Thanks. That's a really, really great explanation. It's a really wonderful overview. I've had very little to do at all with that test, but I wanted to bring in Lisa, Dr. Lisa Doyle, who's been on the group, who's put together this webinar, who has a some works at Pran Market Clinic, as um, Naomi mentioned, and has an interesting anecdote and about the use in the clinic, actually in her clinic of these self-testing kits, which sounds paradoxical. Lisa, would you kindly um, join us for a quick second to um, tell us your story and, and, and uh, tell us about whether Paran Market Clinic is offering um, this rapid test any any point of care test any longer. Hopefully, you can join us. Lisa, you're on mute. Like, sorry about that. Yeah, sorry. Cool, Hi, yeah. I wonder if you could kindly. Um, share with us briefly just the story you had about one of your patients. Yeah, so yeah. Um, um, we actually have had both the oral version and the blood with a Tomo. I'm not sure, I think it might've been, was it Orishaw? Anyway, there was, a, there was definitely a paddle, little paddle where you could run around the inside of the mouth as well. Um, and in fact, um, I diagnosed one new case about two years ago with that, with a person who didn't want blood tests, refused to have blood tests, and extremely anxious and um, that person ended up being positive and came back and engaged with care at that time. Um, but we're, we're actually unfortunately about to stop using those point of care tests because we've got such a low demand for them now. Um, now I'm not 100% sure why that is, but we use them so infrequently, you actually need to have um, a certain amount of accreditation to use them. And you have to do a certain number of tests and you also have to have special liquids that you use for those tests that go out of date. So we've actually been throwing out a lot of tests and a lot of that liquid. And I think we're at the point of actually thinking we it's not actually a viable thing for us to continue to do. But it's been very, very effective. Um, but I would say that we've, we've noticed that there's a much lower demand in our particular setting for that. Thank you very much, Lisa. I really appreciate. I think that's a really nice vignette. Um, Mark, does that surprise you um, to hear that? Oh. Uh, no, not at all. Um, I know. <laughs> okay. Thorn, I know. Um, Pronto have um, managed to sell next to none as well. Um, I guess it, it, it's a weird place to sell self tests at a, at a at a site where you can access, you know, gold standard. Um, HIV testing, you know, I actually think they need, need to be made available in convenient locations that are not um, necessarily clinical because that, you know, that's where you go to, exactly. you know, to get your sexual health care, you know, more recently, they've been made available through pharmacies, um, which I think is a, is a suitable um, place for them. I would, um, at least there, you can have it conversation with a health professional, a pharmacist yeah. or a pharmacist That's assistant. A yeah. Yeah. I, I'm not a fan of, at the moment, making them available on supermarket shelves. I, I think what you end up with is the worried well um, testing in that regard. And, and there are issues with the specificity of the test. So yeah. the more people at low risk who use those tests, the more false positives um, okay. you're actually going to get. So I would... I, I quite like the, the pharmacy distribution model, um, you know, because of that, the reasons I said before. Okay. Well, I might take this opportunity to plug not my work or our work at Alfred Health, but actually Thorn Harbour presented, uh, Colin Petruni presented work 
uh, at Fast Track Cities in Seville just in mid-October about, uh, Mark, I'm sure you've heard about this, over in Shine, South Australia ran a pro program where they had um, uh, self-tests in vending machines in on university campuses and had several hundred people use them. Uh, you had to sort of register online and do all this stuff. Uh, I, be I believe only a handful were positive, but I think the most important thing was that uh, a very high proportion had never tested before, like 60 or 70% or something. I don't want to misquote it. But I thought that that sounded really interesting and and and, and maybe that's a, that perhaps speaks a little bit to what you just mentioned then. The dried blood spot um, uh, test that um, people, half of us didn't know about, New South Wales has that. Is that is, can I ask you a very leading question? What do you think about that for Victoria? Should this be in our, in our um, you know, repertoire of tests? Mm -hmm. Well, they've actually been available in the United States since the mid-90s. Okay. Um, you know, been, oh. been around for a long time. Um I am, um, I'm going to sit on the fence on oh, that. The, okay. the, the New South Wales program has, um, has been very expensive. Um, and the number of diagnoses by dry blood spot in New South Wales over a number of years is relatively low. Um, I know the Kirby are doing a, um, an evaluation of that at the moment. Um, and the numbers I've heard you know, suggests that the the costs of the program per HIV case found um, is going to be very, very high. Um, you know, and and yeah, look, I, I think I think it's an option. Um, and if um, so, that that's that, that's primarily delivered by St Vincent's, um, so Philip Cunningham's uh, lab. Um, they do some great stuff around hepatitis C um, dry blood spot as well, which has been really successful in the prison system. Um, and that's often, you know, really convenient because venous access for people who inject drugs is, is, is sometimes difficult. Um, but the, yeah, I, I think it's a relatively costly program. Um, if it could be implemented in Victoria and, you know, we could export some of the expertise and technology that Philip has to... Um, to vidral, for example, and create and, and think about a relatively low cost model. Um, I, I think it's potentially an option. Um, you know, I'm I'm all for creating options for uh, the community yeah. because what if one size fits all is is not the way to go. Um, right. You know, we really need to put options out there. But I'm, I'm going to sit on the fence on dry blood spot. I'm, okay, I'm, I'm thanks. waiting that's... for that Kirby evaluation to land. Okay, and that's very fair place to sit in that case. Um, is there, just before we switch over to the next um, session, I'll invite you to stay on and chat with uh, Chris Williams and I around the, the uh, actual prevention um, uh, goal for our new HIV plan. Is there anything coming that's really exciting to you in terms of di HIV diagnosis, something that could really be a game changer to try and support people to get tested? Or is it actually what you just mentioned, just having all sorts of options, none of them particularly perfect. I, I think the, the, the probably the most exciting thing on the horizon is the, the Commonwealth Government funded work that um, Queensland positive people are involved in with NAPWA. So they're rolling out, um, you know, via an um, online platforms, a, a national program around HIV self-testing. So using the Atomo device uh, to market that uh, nationally. Um, I, I think that the thing we need to be careful about with those types of trials is that they're offering the tests for free. Um, you know, I would have preferred to see a more um, real world trial um, and the development of a web platform that was ideally there to support people into care. But still, you know, maybe, you know, you might expect governments to subsidise self-testing a little bit. But in reality, any sustainable program going forward is unlikely to be offering HIV self tests for free. Um, I think we need to. I think we need to trial models that are that are actually real world trials. Um, I'll be really interested to see what comes out of the NAPWA QPP um, program. I think it will offer some really interesting process evaluation uh, insights as to what that program might look like. Um, and I think you know, but but I think. Yeah, you know, potentially make self tests free for you know high risk populations, or if you're seeing numbers in in international students go up, 
governments might think about heavily subsidising self-tests for um, those types of visa holders, for example. Um, but the, the widespread access to free self-testing is unlikely to be something that someone like Felicity could sustain within her um, HIV budget in Victoria, right, Felicity? Thank you, Mark. And I just want to draw attention to some terrific comments we're getting. Robert Viz, uh, Viznievsky has made a couple of comments about uh, rapid or point of care tests work better in outreach settings and, and tells us he's worked with DBS for HIV and Hep C in Canada and it worked well in First Nations communities, which is a really, really interesting um, insight. Thanks for that, Robert. So I'm not going to put my slides back on. I'll just, uh, what the slide basically just reminded us all that we have um, one of the goals for this HIV plan is that 95% of people by 2025, 95% of people um, who are at HIV acquisition risk will be uh, use one or more forms of effective HIV prevention, as I said, by 2025. Mark, since you, I'll ask Chris to join us as well. But Mark, what does that sound like to you? Is is ninety five percent of people at HIV acquisition risk are using one or more forms of um, effective HIV prevention? Does that sound plausible, feasible? It's, it's ambitious, um, <laughs> but if you don't have ambitious goals, you know what's the point in in being here? Um, you know, I think, you know, th there's. Uh, discussion around, you know, whether you have realistic goals, whether you have aspirational goals, you know, I, as long as they're recognised as aspirational and, yeah. and that's what we should be striving for, then I think a, a goal like that is fine. And I think with the availability of PrEP, um, you know, and, and I, I, I do think we need to, you know, there, there does need to continue to be some discussion around, you know, the role of condoms, you know, they there's still an option for people and, and some people prefer, you know, a, a wary about, uh, you know, continue to be wary about PrEP. So I think, you know, I'll, I'm very comfortable with with that target as, as an aspiration that we all should be, uh, you know, reaching for. Thank you. Thanks for those in, uh, introductory remarks on this part of the uh, session and addressing this one of these uh, goals for 2025. Chris, could I bring you in? Um, Chris and I have worked together for a long time and he's an outstanding activist um, in, for, in terms of HIV prevention um, as a co-founder of Prep for Change. And um, I just wanted to, and as someone who's continued to stay very actively in touch and engage with the Prep using community and um, remembering how much work it takes as, as a person who's never had acquired HIV once educated me, the amount of work it takes to not acquire HIV probably goes largely unrecognized, but it's certainly sitting there. Chris, that just that figure, 95% of people at HIV acquisition risk, what is it being on some, some, using some sort of tool? What, what does that sound like or feel like to you as somebody who's got your finger on the pulse of that community? Oh, look, I think it's a wonderful goal, Edwina, and, and you know I think it's 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 really great to see something like this is included in Victoria's roadmap to to ending new HIV transmissions, and and it makes me really grateful that that I live in a jurisdiction that shows it's prioritising this as a community issue, and I think while it's good to have goals, um, for me when it comes to those goals, the proof is really in the pudding. Um, I guess the questions that I have coming from those goals are what's going to change in our systems, tools and approaches that really makes achieving those goals a reality? Um, I think the question came up earlier, are we even utilizing what we already have to our best advantage? We heard Felicity mention um, improving efficiencies in our current system, so I'm really curious to see what might, might be happening in, in that space. And, and Mark also touched on the decentralization of, of sexual health care in Victoria. And I'm sure Victorians could benefit hugely from bigger, better, broader sexual health infrastructure, as well as solutions for where we know we're not winning ground, such as with heterosexual populations and uh, overseas born GBMSM. 
And, and, and I think, you know, so far, I, I think we've, we've you know, when it comes to HIV prevention, you know, Mark wrote some really good points around condom usage. It's maybe something that we don't always talk about in the conversation. Um, before we, we get too far in terms of, you know, condoms and PrEP, you know, it would be remiss of me to, to not mention that U equals U is, is a huge contributor as well to HIV prevention. So that's the undetectable equals untransmissible message. And certainly for, for clinicians on the call, um, Edwin, we, we discussed the other day, I, I would certainly urge all of you, if you're not having conversations, with your non-HIV positive patients around the benefits of U equals U and, and what that means for, for them and also people living with HIV, that's definitely a, a conversation I'd encourage you to have. Yeah, and I think, thank you for bringing that point up um, because uh, what we're hearing uh, and the social research is telling us um, and great um, um, plenary speeches at, at talks at ASHAM, um, we've Garrett Prestige teaching us that uh, within gay and bisexual male culture, people who people actively involved in this sector, there is still remains a considerable discrimination against HIV positive men, even with undetectable viral loads, and and that men using PrEP are still not a proportion of men aren't still not comfortable in having sex with people who are um, undetectable and. Mm -hmm. And we don't, I don't fully, I don't think that's been formally studied carefully, but I think it's, some people theorize that it's a younger cohort of younger PrEP users who haven't necessarily, may not even know anyone who's HIV positive and may not know about the viral dynamics and what undetectable means. Um, but it, that, that is, is quite a, a challenge. And, and it's to the point where some HIV positive men living with HIV actually say that they're on PrEP rather than say they're HIV positive and undetectable because actually technically they kind of are on PrEP drugs and they're undetectable so that's uh, that's a way of pre precluding uh, mm. routine um, knockbacks in terms of you know partners etc um, so it, it's uh, so you're in you're asking us as clinicians and healthcare providers to c join um, the ideas of U equals U and the efficacy of PrEP together in our clinical consultations. Absolutely. Right. right. Okay. Uh, I think you know. I think that as well as you know, hearing those messages from a clinician is also a, it's also a powerful message to hear from somebody that, that you know we perceive at community level who has highly educated in a position of authority, and that, that's hugely valuable valuable I think to hear from the clinician um, and, and it breaks down some of the stigmas around HIV that we know are such barriers that, that, that a lot of people face. I can see Felicity's raised her hand. Felicity, please jump in. Thank you. I think I'm going to regret using the word efficiencies. I don't mean it in a negative oh. way at all. Oh. <laughs> so, I know. You can I, walk I, that back. Go for it. <laughs> but I think you that's the efficiency right there is making the connection in 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 the in the consultation about you equals you or having the discussion with women about prep. It doesn't need to be sort of the efficiency like big or rationalization. It it, it can be that that something just having a conversation. So please ignore, I won't use efficiencies again. No, it's fine. partnerships and collaboration. <laughs> no, actually, but actually, now you've thrown thrown that back at us. That's so true. It is the efficiency of combining one aspect of your healthcare brain, how to yep. treat HIV, with the other aspect, which is how to give people prep and remember to just do it. And it's actually born of conversations and attending conferences and if one can, to et cetera, et cetera. Um, thanks, Felicity. Mark, could I bring you back in um, to? talk about condoms uh you raised them and i'll come to chris as well and i know that everyone's thinking why why are they not yet talking about injectable long-acting injectable prep well partly because long-acting injectable prep is still the way off for australia to have at least um, in a subsidized fashion it's been this uh, um, uh, approved by the tga but may not get pbs listing until late next year or even the year after so we are still using we still have to use what we've got the toolbox that we've got and we're fortunate to have the one we have so i wonder if mark could come back in and um are you do you have some nostalgia around condoms or do you just have a great uh, <laughs> uh i know you've studied them a lot and done research but is do you think and chris can answer this too who want to use condoms and not prep and 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 feel pressured to 
use PrEP? Like, what are your thoughts currently about condoms and well, prevention? Yeah, there's certainly been a normalisation of condomless sex, um, yeah. you know, particularly in, in the gay community in, in well, certainly in Melbourne and I suspect elsewhere. Um, you know, I, I think condoms still have a role. I, I think, um, you know, what we're seeing, we, we're seeing large numbers of gay men in surveys discontinue PrEP. For, for various reasons, they, um, you know, they, they may have a, they may enter a, a relationship or they perceive that their risk is diminished and, and, and we are actually seeing, um, you know, verified HIV zero conversions amongst people who have stopped taking PrEP. Um, and, you know, potentially there are, there are issues with stopping and starting and, and needing to get back in and, and seeing a doctor when you increase risk. You know, so I think there are periods of time where condoms may be relevant. Um, but again, you know, that normalisation of condomless sets and, and from a pleasure perspective, it's obviously not the preferred option. So, you know, once condomless sex is normalised for someone, it, it, it's difficult to sort of go back to, you know, what might be considered the bad old days of, you know, of, um, you know less enjoyable sex associated with condoms. Um, there are also issues with uh, STI transmission as well. And you know, obviously PrEP um, is not um, something that protects from you know, curable uh, STIs. Um, and we know, you know through the work of Michael Traeger that you've been involved in, with Edwina that, that there, there are probably, um, you know, there are, you know, the, the increased STI transmissions that we're seeing amongst PrEP users are highly concentrated amongst people with multiple STIs. You know, in PrepX, for example, you know, approximately half of people in the PrepX trial didn't get any STIs at all. Um, and the majority were concentrated amongst about a quarter of, of gay men in the study who got repeated infections. Um, now there may be, you know, yes, getting syphilis or getting gonorrhea isn't like getting HIV, but it, it's, it's certainly something you don't necessarily want and um, you know it's not not a great thing to get an STI you know there may be situations where um, even gay men on prep may think well the last three times I was doing this in this type of environment well you know you know I ended up having to get you know a, a shot of penicillin or, or whatever um, you know, there, there may actually be a role for um, condoms within some risk environments, or, you know, for people who, who may want to prevent um, other STIs as well. Um, look, I, I, I certainly don't want to go back to the it's condoms or nothing, um, you know, phase. You know, we've got an amazing toolkit of, of biomedical prevention options available yeah. to us now that actually make elimination of HIV as a public health threat actually a viable outcome so it's it really is just fabulous you know where we've landed um, yeah. but I do think in some circumstances for some people condoms remain um, you know it should be part remain a part of the uh, conversation. Thank you Mark. Um, Chris how does that sound to you then in terms of how uh, condoms uh, do, do people get kicked out of venues if they're found having condoms on them like what, what's the mood? Well, I, I, you know, I think you both have excellent points there. There is there's a degree of, you know, so social ostracization, if you will, around condom users. And I think it's something that, that we, we forecasted several years ago that, you know, there would be a big paradigm shift in, in this biomedical prevention era. And obviously that facilitates the way to, to have, you know, to, to have condomless sex. That was the whole point of PrEP. Um, so I think, curiously, I mean, I started PrEP maybe seven years ago now and was fairly early adopter. And it was certainly the conversations we had at that time were it was brave for you to talk about the fact that you were using PrEP and it was, you know, courageous that you were doing this kind of thing. And now I think of it and it's really dawning on me that it's actually quite brave and courageous for people to be using condoms in the current landscape, certainly within within gay bisexual men's culture, uh, because it's it's not necessarily the norm anymore, certainly not the norm for inner urbanized uh, gays like like myself, that, that that's not necessarily our experience. There's definitely still a place, though, because not everybody is is urbanized and everybody has the same amount of sex Some people have sex far, far less frequently and therefore don't really, don't really want to use 
something like uh, like PrEP. They, they see it as, as, as unnecessary. And there are also people that, that are just generally not comfortable with using any kind of biomedical solution. It's not the kind of thing they want to put inside their bodies. And that's okay. That's their choice. So condoms have to, to stay in, in the HIV prevention toolkit as, as a viable option. Uh, I guess the challenge we have is how will the people they're having sex with respond to their choice to use condoms and will that be validated and accepted? Thank you. In the last few minutes, I can see there's some comments there. I'll tr quickly try and come to them, but there's something that's on my mind a lot and Mark alluded to, to it, is that people have been on PrEP and we actually saw it in PrEP X. Kat Ryan did an analysis, which we actually haven't published, that people are also I hear from colleagues, so this is now anecdotal, but they the script runs out, they just don't get it refilled. Um, they go into a relationship, stop it, but then the relationship ends and they don't start up again. It, younger people, perhaps more so. So I'm very concerned about where trying to forge some stronger connection where there's a reciprocal understanding between the healthcare provider and the person on PrEP that should that ever happen, there would be some efforts made on both sides to reconsider coming back on PrEP. Because when I talk to my colleagues, they are so busy. They don't follow people up. If they don't come back for the PrEP script, that's it. Now, there, of course, there'll be exceptions, but by and large, that's the case. And I think there's a feeling that that's going to also be the case, although not it won't I don't think it'll be as much the case with long acting injectables that if you it's yours it's like giving the pill to a woman as well you stop using the pill oh she must have decided to she wants to become pregnant what's it and even if the doctor even notices has the time to notice they haven't come back for a script we don't audit our patients constantly to find out who's not coming back that troubles me ethically because if you are a clinician and you have the power nurse or doctor to write a script for prep that can prevent HIV infection, and then you stop doing it because the person doesn't come back and you don't know what they're doing, where is the ethics of that? And where is their own personal ethics around their self-care? So I don't know if people have got any ideas around that. I just um, wanted to raise that point. And it might be something that we need to address going forward, especially when we have things like these pandemics where people literally just stop prep and may never restart it. I just quickly will read the question from David Lee. Um, are there any data on the proportion of PrEPsters who are the worried well in trials and not getting STIs as they're not having a higher rate of partner change? Uh, we know about the worried well from PrepX. It was a very small percentage of people who went on to PrEP just because the idea of getting HIV just sent them bonkers, but they weren't really having a lot of sex. So I don't think a lot of gay and bisexual men necessarily are worried well, but perhaps in the broader community there might be. And um, I've just got a note from Damien Pugliodakis. Um, the Victorian law mandating condom use by sex workers and clients has been repealed earlier this year as part of stage one health reforms of the Sex Work Decriminalisation Act 2022. Damien, thanks a lot for reminding us about that. That's a, it's a very salient point. So, um, if I could, I think I'll keep, um, sorry, uh, Lisa and um, anyone else who wants to jump in and um, to this next topic, um, which is that um, we are going to talk about um, the fact that only 92% of people in 2020, at least, was with, as I mentioned earlier, Max Duvet and Richard Gray's work in the Cascade we're on ART in 2020 in Victoria, um, but we're aiming for, I think, 98% um, to be on ART by 2025. So Lisa, um, can I come to you and ask you the question, why, why aren't people, what do you think about people not being on ART? And Mark, I'll also remember to bring you in on your work with Taipan. And I could, I know Jenny Hoy and others are on this call who worked with you on that. But let's start with a clinician. What mm -hmm. in your experience would have it that 8% um, uh, of people in Victoria are not on treatment? They know they're HIV positive. They may have been on treatment, but they're not now or they've never been on treatment. What do you think is going on there? Yeah, I think... Um... Um, Mark Stuvay's probably got a lot more to um, in research basis of who who these people are. Who in your I, sure, but in your clinical experience, do you? Yeah. 
I've, I mean, I, I actually haven't had a lot of experience in people who haven't. The the couple that I can think of who who haven't um, one in particular could be issues with mental health um, that they struggle oh. with. Um, maybe the stigma of the diagnosis and it's always been an actual significant issue for them and trying to get them engaged in um, other supportive services is really important to recognize I think in particular you're you're talking about prep before and um, I just just want to just flick back to that quickly um, we we there are a lot of people that went off prep or went basically went off prep during the time of the pandemic um, because they weren't having a lot of sex and there were plenty of people who still were on PrEP. Um, our experience or my experience was that um, people quite often when they came back may have heard more about on-demand PrEP and felt a lot more comfortable with that. Um, certainly people who go into relationships and um, go off PrEP. I haven't had a problem with people not re-engaging and taking that, um, that step that, oh, well, now I'm going back out into the world and I, I want to be on PrEP. You know, every I just want to put a little plug in here for primary health care <laughs> that, um, you know, the, the thing that is lovely is when you spend four or five, six, ten years in a, in, a, in a primary health setting, you get to know people and they get to know you. So, in fact, there's this wonderful cohort of younger, younger people and older people who've known um, their clinicians for years and years. And so setting up a relationship of trust mm. is really, really important and non-judgmental available. Um, and so getting back to why do people not stay on uh, art? Well, um, you know, there can be a lot of reasons for that. And part of that may be for some of them, um, fear of being on the medication, fear of side effects, um, non-acceptance, or um, maybe they just don't believe in the medical model. And I'd, I'd sort of um, equate that too to people who don't want to be on statin therapy, for their severe dyslipidemia, their hypertension, um, their diabetes. Um, I've pa patients who just completely refuse, don't believe in COVID <laughs> and come into me wearing masks and gloves and outfits kind of thing. And my job isn't to sit there and judge them or laugh or whatever. It's to try to engage and keep their relationship intact um, and a place of... Um, I know it gets overused, this term of safety, but actually it's a, a space where they can come in and tell me whatever they like. I can offer them good advice, and I think that's uh, important. Thank you. It's such a beautiful clinical um, sort of perspective uh, on people and, 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 and noting the, um, the model of, of having a longer, engaging in a longer, more meaningful relationship with somebody may engender more trust over time. Um, I'm in, I'm going to speak as an HIV specialist um, here now, and I also want to remind the audience that we did have a person living with HIV who would have obviously been very key in this part of the discussion, but they were unable to attend only just recently. So I agree with you. I think um, it's not trust is an issue, um, and medical model not an issue is 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 not their right model for them. Uh, they have other, their life has got so many other things going on. They just simply do not prioritize being on HIV treatment as something of value. And it's something they believe, especially when they're feeling well, that they can defer. Um, and maybe that means we, we haven't explained to them carefully enough uh, what deferral means in terms of longevity. You, you may feel fine now, but you may not, you may lose 15 years of your life in the future. So it is a sort of a relationship um, and I, I find trust is a big issue and uh, people who have had very challenging childhoods and early adolescence, et cetera. Um, the medical model where somebody's telling you to do something and put something into your body um, and take it forever, they're just not going to come at it. Uh, I know that there are some research, Mark, you um, with colleagues at the Alfred and, and in, in I think in James McMahon, Jenny Hoy, um, the Kirby team, you uh, were a big part of the Taipan study, which looked at loss to follow up. Is that right? Um, in different jurisdictions, including Victoria? It was less about loss to follow up. It was, it was more about monitoring the time 
from diagnosis to getting on treatment and viral suppression, which we've yeah, okay. seen My really apologies. shorten over time. It yeah. was a study, though, amongst um, gay men attending the high caseload clinics within the Access mm -hmm. Network. Mm -hmm. um, I actually suspect that, you know, amongst, you know, inner urban living gay men, you know, the number of people, you know, in that cohort living with HIV who are not on therapy is, is much, um, much lower than that. Um, national percentage would indicate. I suggest that the you know that eight percent in Victoria is probably overrepresented by people who are somewhat more marginalised from the health system, uh, maybe less health literate, um, maybe people who contracted HIV via injecting drug use. Um, and you know I was involved in some of the early investigations at the Department of Health when we had a HIV cluster in North Richmond amongst injectors, particularly Aboriginal injectors. Um, and that there was a lot of effort that went in to ensure that people who were diagnosed in that cluster um, accessed care and, and were on treatment. And there were, there were a couple of very challenging cases there where there was a long delay in getting them on therapy. And that always reminded me of a conversation I had with Jenny, uh, Jenny Hoy a long time ago. I think, I can't remember what the study was, Jenny. It was one of those self-congratulatory cascade studies from Denmark or something that had, you know, 98% of people, you know, on, on therapy or something. And, and you turned to me and said, look, don't they have, you know, people with mental health issues or homeless people in Denmark? And, and it really made me think of that conversation when we were, you know, in, investigating that cluster in, in North Richmond. So maybe Jenny's got some uh, insights there as well. Yeah, Jenny, if you're still on, please drop in and, and have a chat with us. Um, I was just going to um, confirm what Mark was saying. The Taipan study didn't really help us um, identify reasons why people weren't on therapy. Um, and I think the study that you were alluding to was the VIPER study that was done in Victoria where we were able to, each site looked at who hadn't been back into care and, and we actually established that quite a few people with HIV had moved their care somewhere else and were still in care, but we weren't aware of that. Uh, I think Lisa's comments about trust and long-term relationships are really valid and and you were describing that as well. Not everybody can attend an appointment at the time they're given that appointment. And so we need to establish mechanisms whereby people can just arrive at a clinic, have some blood tests. There's a, there's a um, prescription already pre-written. It can be given to them by the nursing staff. And, and we have quite a few... Um, Patients who are perhaps chaotic in that way, but who maintain virological suppression because they will turn up when they're run when they've run out of medication. So if those mechanisms are in place for them, then you know we can ensure that ongoing um, virological suppression. That was just all I wanted to say. Yeah, no, thank you. And thank you uh, for correcting me. It was the study I was thinking of. It was still good to hear about Taipan as well. But yeah, it's exactly. Jenny, we have um, a walk-in clinic at the Alfred ID department, don't we, for people to, it's tricky with COVID, um, really challenged that model, didn't it? Because we have weren't able to have people attend the clinic um, no, COVID was problematic, um, but it's back up and running again now, so people can just drop in. Yeah, it makes me wonder if we should be looking at having things like a virtual drop-in clinic, so people can just dial in, so that there's always something, someone there. Yeah, um, and because you know we we've got what our fourth wave coming. Sure, apparently, touch wood, it will be relatively brief. But um, drop maybe this is something we can consider virtu virtual drop-in um, rooms and uh, take it from there. Um, one of the things I think it's worth mentioning, um, forgive me if it's Jenny, please feel free to stay on um, and, and please happy to take um, 
comments as well. I'm trying to in integrate them into the discussion. Uh, and it was actually something that uh, Jenny and my colleague Olga and I, Olga Vujovic, um, was talking about today, which was that we haven't seen and, and yet, and perhaps it will change over the eight years of this strategy, or at least for the next few, a big uptake in injectable long-acting treatment. Um, we have hopes for it that it could, and, and, um, but we actually haven't seen a huge demand for, for that. Um, Jenny, do you have some thoughts on that? And, and Mark, for in terms of treatment modalities, and, the, and is it only the early adopters and you have to wait a long time before you get people up taking things? Jenny, do you want to reflect on our experience at the Alfred and any other clinicians could put some comments in the chat? Um, I think some of it may be that we did not do the clinical trial at the Alfred. I, I always think that clinicians become comfortable with new therapies when they're involved in clinical trials. And, and Pran Market and Lisa, certain, Lisa Doyle certainly um, were part of the clinical trial. And um, I think their uptake is much better than ours um, and other clinics. But I guess, you know, when, when people reflect that they will have to attend a clinic every two months for those injections compared to attending the clinic once or twice a year and just taking one pill once a day that's not causing them significant side effects. I think a lot of people take a step back and think, you know, parking at the Alfred is so expensive. Um, and, you know, having to turn up there every two months would be a bit of a pain in the neck. And really, one pill once a day is fine if it's not causing side effects. There are certainly groups of people that I think would really like to take it up, those that are traveling, et cetera, um, a lot. May, you know, trying to change time zones and taking tablets is tricky. Whereas if you've got that cover, it doesn't matter. Um, but for me, I think it's actually comparing the really well tolerated one pill once a day and only having to go to the clinic once or twice a year compared to having to go every two months. That might be the game changer for some people. But Lisa would have much more insight into that. Thanks very much, Jenny. That point's so well made. Lisa, would you like to talk about being uh, having been involved in the trial, what the uptake has been like in patients who were not in the trial? And and the long and I understand people in the trials tend to stay on the drug, uh, which is great. But I'm in I think we'd probably be interested in new patients coming and asking for it. Yeah. Um, I, I, um, I can only just give you a, sh a very brief kind of overview of what we've we found. Uh, I think that for a lot of people in the trial, they have had a really, um, they've it's been beneficial for them, and they're staying on it. I think that we now are at the point of offering it to people on a more um, more open basis outside of a trial, and it's probably a little bit of a slow uptake. I think too, when people find, and we've sort of spoken about this before, that they have something that works for them. They're really comfortable. They really, it's one tablet. It's not eight tablets, it's one. And um, and it's fine. And they don't even really have to think about things. It's it's then you have to give them a reason why, why would you change over? And I mean, this is just coming from my perspective. So not as a clinic perspective here. Um, so I know I've had one person recently who travels for work a lot. And they are in a multitude of different uh, cities and you know, countries uh, where it may be more comfortable for them not to be carrying any medication. And they've brought that up with me, so we'll start talking about it. And But it isn't, I'm not finding an overwhelming request for this at this point. But I think it's also early days. I think that the more that people get comfortable with, you know, as you say, they have to come in. They have to, you know, the, the medication has to be kept cold right up until just before they come in. I think we can learn a lot by it from international experience too, um, how they have set things up. Um, but to translate that into our circumstance, um, I think we're all still learning. Yep. Thank you very much. I can see Tina Schmitz put a comment in saying she very much agrees with Jenny, with her patients, Melbourne Sexual Health, 
A few are interested in hearing about it, but most are happy to stay with one tablet a day and two clinic visits a year. Just um, briefly, um, Lisa, I, you mentioned um, so aptly that there are people who decide to opt out of having appropriate treatment for diabetes, for hypertension, for a whole lot of things. They just go, no, not doing it. Don't want to, you know, and that we accept that that's just normal practice. It's frustrating as we get closer towards and meeting the definitions of virtual elimination of HIV transmissions, which we defined earlier in the night, I'm a bit concerned that there'll be increasing pressure on people who are not on treatment to take it. Uh, and, but I think people have a right to not take treatment. Do you, do you have any similar concerns or do you think it's, do you think the, the analogies are similar that people, lots of people in the community don't do the right thing, if you like, in terms of their treatment for other illnesses? Yeah, I think um, it'll be interesting to see if that is the case. Um, I'd, um, I'd, I, I think that for getting back to the, the idea that, um, yeah, what is our role as, um, whether it's as clinicians or even in the community, you know, there's a lot of community health care and outreach. Um, I think our jobs are to um, try to, you know, find if we're looking at this as the overall HIV elimination strategy, um, is to find people and find out why they haven't even accessed a test in the first place. And then when they, you know, um, be honest, open and, and available so that you can give them all the information they need um, and offer them continuity of care um, and non-judgmental environment, then, yeah, that's we're more likely to be successful. And looking at yeah, these different models, so I'm in a GP practice, but I've worked for CoHealth in the past, which is a fabulous community health organisation that has a lot of outreach into maybe communities that, um, you know, where it may be more challenging for them to come in and get tested, you know, and, and to really engage with, um, you know, those different communities. So from my you know, practice perspective, I think that idea of being non-judgmental, available and uh, finding people and giving them information and they get to make up their own minds what they want. Thank you very much, Lisa. I'm going to go on now and invite, uh, I've got Olga. I'll come back to you, Olga, please. I'll, um, we're just going to push on. We have time for some comments in the end. I'm so sorry. Um, Chris and Naomi, we've got, we're going to move on to another um, part of tonight. We um, have two provocation questions, which are very relevant to our next invited guest. Thanks, Chris. Uh, thank you very much, Edwina. Yes, we, we prepared these these questions um, in preparation for for coming to our, to our next guest. Um, but Naomi, hopefully you'll be able to pop this up on the screen. The first question that we wanted to ask was: uh, In a recent survey, what proportion of healthcare workers said they would behave negatively towards other people because of their HIV? And um, we've got multiple choice questions of 4%, 21%, 32%, or 50% of healthcare workers said they would behave negatively. If you're able to, to cast your vote, um, that would be great. And Naomi, over to you. I'll let you let me know when, uh, when those good votes are in. Now, so I'll share that. Um, interestingly, 42% think 21%. Awesome. The majority think it's 21%. Uh, and there is second majority is 4%. So that's quite a low expectation around healthcare workers. I, I mean, that would be nice to think. And 32% said 60% 60, 60 of you said it was 32. And a handful of you said it was going to be 50%. So I can reveal that this research uh, into this actually came out and identified that 32% of healthcare workers surveyed said that they would behave negatively towards other people because of their HIV. Now, the research does indicate a sliding scale of, you know, to what degree of, of negatively or how negatively they, they would uh, would behave. But certainly, it is it is quite a, a large a large figure to to identify. Um, and I think there is a second follow up question in, in a similar vein to this. Uh, now, hopefully, if you're ready to have that onto the screen, in a recent survey, what proportion of people living with HIV reported experiencing any stigma or discrimination in relation to their HIV status within the last 12 months. We've got multiple choices of 14%, 37%, 65%, and 80% if you're able to cast your votes. Uh, Naomi, hopefully you can let me know when that's, when that's in. You're getting a few votes, I'll just give it another couple of seconds. 
And there we go. So 53% of people, uh, I think it's 65% of uh, people living with HIV experience uh, stigma and discrimination. Oh, I didn't see that on my screen unless I managed to close it. Oh, there it is. Fantastic, fantastic. There we go. Eleven percent of you thought, yeah. So quite a spread across the board, but a large proportion, or half, people thought it was about sixty-five percent of people. Fortunately, it is smaller, but that number is is thirty-seven percent of people living with HIV um, have experienced stigma discrimination in relation to the HIV status in the last twelve months. So that kind of does correlate closely with the thirty-two percent of perhaps healthcare providers that that said that they they would discriminate, and perhaps those numbers are are, are reflective of each other. Uh, just to clarify, that research is is conducted by the University of New South Wales Centre for Social Research in Health and is known as the Stigma Indicators Monitoring Project. Thanks so much, Krish. Um, and Naomi, could I uh, please invite Graham, Professor Graham Brown to join us on the screen. Um, uh, who, Graham is, um, as Naomi mentioned, he's um, working as the director, or I think de deputy director of the Centre for Social Impact at UNSW. And he has really been a, a real leader for us in terms of helping uh, understand uh, quality of life and um, how to measure it um, in people living with HIV. Graham, are you able to um, yep, come? Yeah, I'm here. Oh, you're there. Hello. <laughs> um, they're pretty um, stunning figures about stigma and discrimination. I, and I know, to be fair, I, I know you're across all these areas, but quality of life is a big part of your research wisdom and, and, and work. But let's come in from that angle of, of stigma and discrimination. How much is quality of life influenced by stigma and discrimination? And um, how damaging would it be to have stigma, especially in the healthcare setting? Thanks, Joanna. Look, it's, um, it's been a fascinating discussion tonight, and um, certainly there's a whole range of aspects there. I just I was also reflecting on, you know, quality of life impacts directly on people's choices to even get diagnosed, let alone, let alone going on treatment and so forth, and for where people are at. And stigma is a major part of that. Um, sometimes I think we, we forget that quality, like a change in someone's quality of life, say so an improved quality of life, um, is actually an outcome of reducing inequity, reducing isolation, reducing racism, reducing um, stigma around HIV. It's, a, it's an outcome of increasing confidence and access to healthcare and so on. Um, and often we see quality of life as being about just about an individual, but it's actually about the whole systems and, and services and networks around a person. So unless we're actually able to, for example, reduce stigma at a societal level, it actually makes it harder to increase people's quality of life. Um, so in, in that sense, that they're, they're, they're quite closely connected. Um, it's, I think stigma is also a very good example of, um, particularly with, I mean, we'll, we'll talk about PulseQual in a moment, the, the scale that we've developed, but quality of life can be quite a good indicator of, um, most of us are aware, and certainly clinicians are very aware, for example, of patients who are absolutely struggling. But what can be more difficult to sort of pick up or identify are those whose quality of life is shifting, but they're, they're holding it together. But if one extra thing starts to fall over, then it's all going to be like a bit of a, you know, a house of cards. And so quite often, um, I think we've all been in that situation where people can um, present as though everything's going well. Um, but they're using up a lot of energy to maintain that, that presentation. And I think stigma is one of the things that actually, and racism are the things that sort of undermine that, that capacity. Right, that's fascinating. So the, the inter so it's so nice to think, not nice, but it's very refreshing to just keep understanding how things do come together, stigma, racism, quality of life because for quite a lot of people, perhaps on this call, at least a proportion have not necessarily experienced a lot of stigma, discrimination and racism in their lifetime. And hence we wouldn't necessarily think how closely interrelated they are. Maybe stigma around sexual preferences, et cetera. We've, you mentioned, would you like to comment on that or Chris? Yeah, well, I was just gonna, I was, I was actually just gonna say, we've got, you know, we have a lot of, um, by the names, we have a lot of women on the call, and I'm sure plenty of women have experienced um, stigma and, and sexism, in, and, and even in professionally. And so that's yeah, 
I think it's, it's, it's another aspect that actually can undermine people's capacity. Yeah, thank you. Um, good point. Chris, just quickly drop in if you could in terms of um, stigma for being a, a gay man and being open about being a gay man and open about enjoying sex and wanting to, you know, be people who say, yeah, I love sex, I'm on prep and yeah, I get STIs. Like, how hard is that for people to say to a, even to a, not even to a healthcare worker? Do you think? And this is, please, this is anecdotal, I know, but it's uh, people you know and talk with. It, it's huge because shame is such a debilitating factor. And and a lot of queer people have, have grown up under, under this notion that, that who they are and what they do is something to be sh ashamed of. So, so talking, I mean, even societally, I think culturally, we have discomfort when it comes to talking about sex and intimacy, regardless of our orientations about that. So when you kind of compound that with, with this kind of notion of shameful of, of who you are based on your identity, then it's no wonder that, that queer people are not interested in really disclosing that unless they feel safe to do so. And, and I, I really want to, you know, recognize and, and, and say thank you to, to, to Lisa and, and all of you who, who do this in your practice to be able to, to um, you know, when I go to a doctor, it's so important for me to not feel judged and, and to feel validated and that actually encourages me to open up and have those difficult conversations with my healthcare provider and it becomes then this this shared responsibility I can work with my provider to be able to get the healthcare that I want um, I, I wish that, that, that all, all queer people were as driven and determined and bloody minded as I am about, about looking after their sexual health um, but sadly that's not the case um, but I work towards that yeah, well, but we'll be drawing on you over the next eight years for, for guidance <laughs> and wisdom. Graham, um, 75% of people, we are hoping, 75% of people living with HIV um, will have a good quality of life by 2025. And the tool that you've pioneered is POSQOL. And you, um, I understand that we're monitoring quality of life actually in Victoria at a population level. Could you tell us a little bit about POSQOL and which populate, how are we going to monitor them, the population? Sure. Thank, thanks, Rita. Um, I suppose the only quick thing I was going to say, adding to Chris's point, is, um, I mean, also for where, it's where some of the POSQOL came from, particularly in clinical settings, um, is people's quality of life. So the stigma, the fear they're experiencing outside undermines a clinician's capacity to provide really good health care. It, it sets up a barrier that clinicians have to kind of or clinics are trying to overcome, um, even if within the clinic it's a really safe place. It's needing to be a safe place because so many other spaces are not safe. Um, and so kind of things we've developed was um, PulseQual, for those aren't aware, it's, um, it's a short scale that we developed. It uh, was developed for and by people living with HIV with huge amount of partnership and support from clinics and researchers and community and, and industry and so on. Um, but it's a really short, just 13 item sort of tick the box type scale um, that correlates really well with a whole range of other larger scales around resilience, around stigma, um, around psychological well-being, social connection and so forth. So we've been able to sort of shrink it right down to just a short scale. Um, and what we found is that it seems to work very effectively, both at a population level, as Edwina was saying. So the um, National HIV Futures Study is done each um, every three years and POSQOL's in that. So we've got results will be coming out on World AIDS Day from HIV Futures about the tracking and, and some of the changes that are, that are happening in um, quality of life within each state, which I can come back to. Um, what I've been really excited, though, is how useful the scale has become within a lot of clinical and community settings of working with patients on an individual basis, but also organisations seeing where how their cohort of the, the, the people with HIV that they're working with compare to national and state results sort of you know who are they reaching compared to it to the the general sort of broader averages and so on what's been exciting with working at a um, individual level now I need to preface this um, I am not a clinician in fact I don't even have a valid first aid certificate at the moment so I'm so far removed from being a clinician um, but I've been working with a lot of clinicians and um, Edwina and Jenny and others on the call have been, have been part of the whole project. What's been really exciting is it's a really short scale um, that has, I'll pop a link in the chat in a bit, but 
So cross areas like social, psychological, health concerns and functional, but really what it enables people to do is pick up, um, to open up questions with um, patients after they've completed the scale um, and you can see sort of where they are compared to other people living with HIV. It can often open up discussions that otherwise wouldn't happen. Um, I was speaking to a clinician recently and they are saying what it really cut through was speaking particularly with some um, some women with HIV who felt what they're experiencing was as good as it's going to get. And being able to actually fill in a scale and go, well, and the Christian himself say, well, actually a lot of women with HIV are doing better. They've been able to progress. They've been able to build and strengthen and so forth. And it kind of changes the bar of what's actually possible. Um, and it provided really good effective referral then for them to see a female peer navigator and start having those sort of discussions where previously they were resisting doing that. Um, so in that sense, it can be really useful, but the other part is that we can actually track changes over time. And by we, I mean like clinicians, we have to see, you know, might be doing Pulsqual, you know, perhaps once a year in one of the longer appointments um, and actually just tracking over time to check if people are actually starting to, um, changes in quality of life are usually a symptom of other significant things happening in their life that people aren't always going to talk about. And it's a really yeah. effective way to come through. And it will be monitored every three years in the futures? Is it the future? Yeah, so in the future study. So I can say um, I've been, been given a sneak peek um, of the results coming out on World AIDS Day for the most recent futures. So um, nationally, um, the Pulse results have gone up. In terms of good, um, I need to emphasise we sort of picked a mid-range figure on the scale. Good quality of life doesn't mean great. It means it just means good that they're getting like they're you know they're managing. Um, partly because it really wasn't going to be a great line to say we want seventy five percent of people with being to have a moderate quality of life. It wasn't really a term that we we're going to be able to use. So I just wanted to sort of emphasise it doesn't mean fantastic. Um, but we've moved from about sixty one percent a number of a few years ago to this year coming out as 71.8%. So we haven't hit the, hit the 75. However, I would emphasize the, the results vary a lot from state to state. Um, Victoria is around 68%. Um, New South Wales is about 75%. But there have been changes in the actual, I mean, we can go into that later, but I actually think that's partially because in Victoria, it's, it could be that we got a more representative sample in Victoria um, than in New South Wales, who had a big drop in the number of people with HIV participating who were on um, fixed income or support income. So, you know, things like that can vary a little bit. Overall, I'm quite confident that quality of life amongst people with HIV has gone up, um, but how much, I'm not 100%. 100% sure, but we're heading in the right direction. Oh, um, I feel pretty confident of getting to 75 by 2025 if we can maintain the momentum, if we can maintain the kind of really effective healthcare and so on. What would be good is to, for, I suppose, individual services to know how their own, their own clients and so forth are going. Yeah, thank you. And on that point, um, uh, uh, could I... Okay. A, it would be wonderful if clinics could be incentivized, have some incentive. And I, I'm sorry, Felicity, I'm going to pretend that I, I'm looking at you as I say this. But can you imagine if you, you not only are we the dear, you know, ever true filling out survey positive population telling us every three years, but what can we find out about ourselves and how we're tracking? It's not that it's not that easy Graham you and I have workshop quite a few different scenarios where a busy clinic could find a way to incorporate incorporate POSQUAL into their what they do it's not that easy you've got to be very systematic and you've got to have someone to collect the data and you've got to have the time to find out when you thought you would just have a quick consult with the easy patient that actually they're more dreadfully depressed or something awful has happened so it isn't easy we would need incentives to have clinician clinical practices and all different types monitoring perhaps every three years with the, with the population. So I'd love to think well, there was some sort of incentive around that. Um, I'm so it's, I'll just, 
Oh, sorry, I was just going to say we've got, yeah, I was just going to say we've got some great initiatives happening hopefully next year that's going to be able to support clinicians and some other things to trial some ways that are going to be effective. Oh, Jenny, I didn't see your hand up, sorry. Yeah, go ahead, Jenny. So, uh, Graham, I can tell you now that Postpol is running at the Alfred. <laughs> Um, and we've actually, um, we're just in the process of including POSQUAL on our quality dashboard for each clinician. So each clinician's patients, they'll be able to have an average um, POSQUAL. And um, the way we're doing it is the week before their appointment in clinic that they do have to be registered for the patient portal so we're also including the number of your patients that are registered for the patient portal on the dashboard they get an invitation to complete posqual and um, then when they come into clinic the clinician will know whether it's been completed it's in the clinical notes section you can see all of the results and you can start those conversations. So, and we're also able to track over time the scores for the four components of POSQUAL. Um, so we'll be able to see changes on an annual basis. So finally, after a year, it's Jenny. working. <laughs> Thank That's you, Jenny. So it's been a heroic <laughs> effort that you've led at the Alfred to to bring that about it's heroic and it and I think it's inspirational and I'm absolutely I don't well I can't imagine a clinician I know not wanting to have a way to measure their patient's quality of life there's just no way anyone would not want to know but I'd I'd love to think that we could have some incentives and workshops and ways to help people streamline that to bring that into their clinic because actually uh, by 2030 as I mentioned earlier um, we are meant to uh, have only 10% of people reporting stigma or racism in healthcare or the support or support settings. So that is our job to monitor that. That is our job to know about that. Um, I've got, we've got, we're, we should have had about uh, 10 minutes for quick conversation. Graham, um, since you waited so patiently and haven't yet had the full 15 minutes that we were hoping to allocate, or oh, nearly there actually, do you, can um, any closing comments from you around quality of life and its its role, how important it is for this strategy? I think I suppose two things I'd say is one is it's similar to stigma. We know the interconnection between stigma and racism and quality of life and so forth. Um, for me, being having a, an insight into people's quality of life in a way that they don't have to suddenly explain a whole lot of things. So it kind of allows them to, to say things without having to have a whole conversation. Um, to me, it's, it's, it's a tool for achieving really good patient-centred care, um, to be able to send a very clear signal to patients that they they matter beyond their vi their undetectable viral load if they've yeah, achieved that, viral that, load. That's such a great. Um, yeah. So that's that's some of the feedback that we've had from other pa from from people that we've been working with is just just the very sense of it being sent out of of, of clinics asking mm -hmm. these questions mm -hmm. sends a really clear signal. Um, when we do that, when we get the engagement, that's when I think it, it starts to link really directly to the broader goals of the whole like the the HIV strategy. Um, when we have a really engaged clients, we have engaged communities, um, then we're going to achieve those sorts of results. Thank you very much, Graham. Mark, can I ask, invite you to uh, drop in and, and just any comments that uh, you, you'd like to make or questions you would hope you'd been asked, any reflections on the strategy and, and advice? No, look, I think the strategy is a wonderful document. I think um, having those having a go after 2030, you know, aligns with, you know, the WHO elimination targets. It, it now aligns, you know, the, the, the national strategy has gone in the same direction across BBVs and STIs. Um, the, you know, the monitoring plan that we've set up and, and you know, I, I think the uh, Victorian Department of Health, um, you know, relative to previous strategies has, you um, really embraced, I think, the expertise in the community more in, in relation to um, measuring things and measuring our progress. And 
um, you know, keeping the strategy to some extent, a, 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 you know, a living document and, and that, you know, we will monitor, um, you know, we, we will be able to monitor as we go and refine our strategies as we go. Um, you know, I think, you know, we, we spoke about earlier, Edwina, around resources and all of those sort of things. And I know it's a fiscally, you know, a very difficult type of government. Um, but, you know, we, we do need more investment. Um, and, you know, I think, you know, Felicity for meeting the sandwich here, you know, she knows that. Um, but, you know, I think, you know, we, we continue to perform extraordinarily well in Victoria through our partnership approach. And, and uh, you know, I know, you know, you get feedback from other states that, you know, I think the Victorian sector around HIV and, and BBVs is, is incredibly collegiate relative to other jurisdictions. And, you know, I think we're really well placed, um, you know, with, with the team of people we've got and, and the sector and, and its goodwill and its willingness to support each other here. So, you know, I'm, I'm really excited about, about the strategy and, and where we're heading. Thanks, Mark. There's such great words to hear. And if I could finally end with inviting Felicity to um, drop in if she's still with us. Hopefully she is. I know. Thanks for spending the evening with us, Felicity. Any final comments or uh, questions you were hoping you'd be asked you might want to address so uh, we'd love to hear from you I, I, I just want to say thank you for saying lovely things about it it was two and a half years of work so it is nice to hear that but I just want to thank everyone things like the quality of life target prevention target stigma target they're all in there because of feedback from everyone from the consultations we had so in some ways it was really easy for us to include that because we had a strong argument why because that was the um, that was the consultation feedback. So thank you very much. Um, we, we're going to try to live up to everyone's expectations. Uh, but I think the benefit of having the um, eight-year strategy does give us the time to get some population health gains, which you can't do with a four-year strategy, but that it will be phased in over time. Yes, it's a fiscally um, constrained environment. If we keep having floods and pandemics, that will only get worse. But there is already quite... Um, a bit of exist, existing investment in the system. So we do have that to work with compared to some other states and some other um, health issues. So I just want to say it's been lovely hearing all of this and thank you very much. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you. And um, I, I've had a, it's been a real pleasure to work with the team, Lisa, Chris and Naomi. I might hand over to you, Naomi, to um, close the night for us. Thank you. Edwina. Um, so I will just quickly share my screen. Just so we've got, oh, hang on. I can do that if you like, give you the last slide. Would you like me to do oh, that? Oh, uh, sure, the thank you slide. Yeah. yeah great thanks very much um so we just have a um very quick short little um survey that we would absolutely love um everyone who's come along to fill out our evaluation survey um on this i've popped the link in the chat but it's also there on screen for you as well so um thank you thank you everyone very much for coming along and listening to all of our speakers and certainly thank you very very much to our entire panel um i think everyone's really really enjoyed and some of the um comments that have come through is that everyone's just really uh, loved your insights. Um, so thanks very much again. So Edwina, Lisa, Chris, Mark, um, Graham and Felicity, really appreciate uh, you coming along and spending the night with us tonight. Thank you. Hi, thanks again.